All right, this is the uh, grace in the book of Romans uh, class where we are studying the theme of grace as Paul uh, writes about that particular idea in his epistle to the Romans. This is lesson number nine in this series. And the title of this particular lesson is The Response of Grace. We've been kind of looking at this response of grace section here. This is the part six of that. And uh, that'll be in Romans chapter six and we will cover verses 15 to 23 if the Lord is willing today. All right, so after uh, presenting the gospel as God's offer to save man in response uh, to man's faith in Christ, Paul proceeds to answer several questions that may arise from the teaching that he's given his readers. One objection was the idea that if God is gracious to us as sinners, well then what motivation do we have to avoid sin? You know, we got it made. Why, you know, why should we try to avoid sin? So this objection uh, that is made is expressed in two questions in Romans 6. And Paul answers the same question twice, but he answers it in different ways. So in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, the question was, since grace always expands to accommodate greater and greater sin, why not just relax and remain in sin knowing that grace will cover it? You know, why make an effort? I mean, in this way, sinning actually causes more and more grace to be supplied. So Paul responds to this by explaining that once we come into God's grace, we die to sin and we no longer see or participate in sin in the same way that we did before we knew God's grace. So Paul, we talked about this last time, so Paul explains that we don't try to provoke the increase of grace by sinning because something has happened to us historically. Something happened to us in the past. What happened to us in the past? Well, he explains we died to sin. And when did that happen? When we were buried in the waters of baptism, we died to sin. And we no longer see or respond to sin in the same way. That's why we don't do, you know, that's why we don't sin in order to cause more grace. We don't think about sin in the same way as we did before that historical thing happened where we were buried with Christ. So Paul again poses the same question, this time in verse 15. And he responds to it in a different way from verses 16 to 23. So let's take a look at verse 15. He says, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? May it never be. So the question is this, just because our salvation is offered to us because we believe in Jesus, right? Based on a system of faith through grace, and not because we obey the law. I'm not saved because I obey the law perfectly. Well, does this mean that we can disobey the law without guilt or fear? So before, Paul answered this type of question from an historical perspective, saying that we don't pursue sin anymore because something happened in our past, at baptism to be precise, Something happened in our past where sin lost rulership over us and we now have a different view of sin. In verses 15 to 23, Paul is going to answer this question experientially by saying that since that historical moment, the grace of God has produced a new experience for us. And that experience that we have because of grace he refers to as eternal life. Now we need to understand in the Bible when we talk about eternal life, we're not just talking about time, you know, time forever, never ending. That's one aspect of eternal life. But eternal life also refers to an experience. Okay? So it's not just time, it's what you experience forever. 
So he says, the grace of God has produced a new experience for us, eternal life. And this new experience is made up of different things. For example, this experience is made up of our knowledge of our personal righteousness with God. In other words, one thing that I feel or that I know or that experience in this eternal life mode is that I know that I'm okay with God. That's part of my eternal life experience. Every day when I'm awake and I offer my prayer to God, I, I know I'm okay with Him. Part of the eternal life experience is, is not having to dread, not having to fear God, because I am continually made aware of by His word, by the Spirit within me, that I'm okay with God, I'm acceptable to Him. That's part of the experience of eternal life. Secondly, Another part of the experience is the discernment of the change in our character through the inner working of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit in me is changing me. Now there's another term for this and that is sanctification. I am being sanctified. I am being changed because of my experience, uh, my past experience. What, what past experience? Oh, that baptism, that new life that I arose from or arose to rather. So that's part of the eternal life experience. I see and I realize that I am not the same person anymore. Now you, you don't see that from day to day. You see that by looking back. If I, if I go all the way back to the time when I was baptized, boy, I surely do see a much different person now that I am, that I have become than what I would have become had I continued on the road without Christ. Boy, the two different results. So part of the eternal life experience is the experience of seeing myself changed, okay, as a spiritual being. And then the third part of that experience is the growing assurance of our resurrection from the dead. You know, I said a couple of weeks back, you know, uh, you know, when you're young, you don't think you're going to die because there's not a lot of evidence to that. Because you get up in the morning, you, know, you, you stay up late, you eat pizza at two, in the, at two in the morning, you go straight to bed, you get up four hours later, you're fine, you take a shower, you go work 10 hours, no sweat, and then you get dressed and you go out at night and you repeat it. And yeah, but you know, we kind of know, I'm looking in the audience here, we kind of know that by the time you hit 30, 40, you know, you, well, there's no more pizza at 2 a.m., I guarantee you that one, right? So we begin to realize, you know, I'm slowing down, things are falling apart. Death becomes, yeah, hmm, I really do believe that people die because I see myself kind of withering away. So what is the experience of eternal life? One of the aspects of the experience of eternal life is I have assurance, greater and greater assurance that I will rise from this death, that I will live again with Christ. And the knowledge and the assurance of this gives me joy despite the fact that I know that one day I'll pass from this, from this world. So Paul is saying this total experience here is far superior and much more motivating than our old experience of disobedience, condemnation, fear, and the dread of death and punishment, because that was my experience before Christ. In other words, this eternal life experience that I enjoy under grace motivates me to serve and obey God much more than the experience of condemnation and punishment under the law ever did. I don't want to go back to being under the law because that experience was not pleasant. I want to remain with the eternal life experience because that experience is much more motivating. All right, verse 16. He says, do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. So he states the case here in, in, in general terms. If you serve sin, then the experience you will have 
um, will be death. If on the other hand you serve Christ, the experience you will have will be life, eternal life. The kind of life that I've just explained, okay? All right, verse 17, he says, but thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. So here he refers back to that, you know, the historical moment when a person believes as true the message of the gospel and responds to that message in faith expressed in repentance and baptism. This is the biblical response to the gospel. Anything less than this or anything different than this, this is not of, not of God. You know, some people say, why? I, you know, I'm at church sometimes and I see a person who's baptized you know, and they're baptized over again. Why do they do that? Because they weren't baptized for the right reason. That's why, for the, a biblical reason. Or they weren't baptized in a biblical way. And they want to get the reason and the method according to the scriptures. So when Paul is talking about that form of teaching which you were committed, you know, they were committed to obeying what? Well, the gospel, that it was preached to them. And they had that, ex that historical experience. So uh, Paul explains that um, this response effectively frees us from sin in that we die to it. It no longer rules over us. Now, our motivating factor now is to do what Christ leads us to do. In other words, in the past, sin was leading us to do all kinds of things, all kinds of evil things, right? So he says, but now grace is leading you to do all kinds of things. So we, we grow in our awareness of this as our understanding of the Bible deepens and our sensitivity to the Holy Spirit within us continues to grow. Verse 19. He says, I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteous, to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. So he exhorts them to preserve what is good and right with the same enthusiasm that they pursued sin knowing that the rewards are much, much greater. You, know, you were aggressively pursuing sin before, you were aggressively in the world before, you were presenting your members to sinfulness before to get all kinds of gratification, sinful gratification, and what did it do for you, he said? Well, you know, what was the result of all that? Uh, guilt, shame, fear, dread of condemnation, you know, what was the result of that? Not to mention the physical you know, the physical results of sin. So he says, well now, because of that historical experience you had, now you're going to pursue righteousness. And as you pursue righteousness, there will be some results. And he's telling them the results of what, you know, of pursuing righteousness will be much greater, much more pleasant, much more profitable to you than the results of the pursuit of sinfulness. Verse 20. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. It reminds them that when sin ruled over them, they accepted that rule and Christ you know, did not and could not motivate them. This is why we should not be disappointed when people who are not in Christ, you know, those who have not had that, ex that historical experience, when those people do not act in ways which are Christian. I see people all the time, you know, let's say in a mixed religious marriage, you know, the wife, let's say, is a, a Christian member of the church, the husband is not, not a religious person. You know, she comes to church, he goes, you know, whatever, he does whatever he does. The marriage keeps going, but there's that separation there. And, and, and sometimes, you know, the, the Christian partner will come for some counseling, some encouragement, and, and, and they'll say, oh, I just don't understand. Why does he act this way? I told him, you know, this isn't right the way he does this and that. And my answer to them is, why are you expecting somebody who is not a Christian to act like a Christian? They don't have the spirit of God within them. 
They're not relying on God's word to direct them. Why would you think that, you know, what motivation do they have to act like Christians? You know, stop expecting that. Don't stop preaching. Don't stop giving the good example. Don't stop praying for them. But stop demanding that they act like Christians when they're, when they're not. Okay? So only Christians act like Christians. You cannot be motivated by Christ without the historical experience that enables you to be in Christ. Verse 21. Let's keep our thought. It's all one thought here. Okay? Therefore, he says, what benefit uh, were you then deriving from the things which you are now ashamed of? For the outcome of those things is death. Summary statement. He reminds them of the outcome of this rulership of sin, shame, ultimately condemnation and death. Always making the same argument. Verse 22. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome, eternal life. So he compares that experience, you know, when you were under sin, to the new experience a person has since his historical break with sin. And what is that experience? Well, that experience is righteousness. I'm okay with God. You feel that. That's not just some theological concept. That's not some sort of mathematical equation. You experience something when you are uh, uh, okay with God. And, 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 and some of them say, yeah, but what? Can you put a name to that experience? Uh, you can put many names, but one of them is peace. Peace of mind. I, I go to bed at night and I maybe think about my day, it's been a good day, oh, but I did this, or I could have tried a little harder there, or you know, whatever. But in the end, my ultimate feeling is I have peace. I'm, I'm okay with God. He doesn't judge me on my performance to the rules. He judges me based on my faith and continued faith in Him despite my imperfection. That gives me peace. I close my eyes, I go to sleep, thank you God. I go to sleep at night, close my eyes, say, thank you, God. If you give me another day, great. If you take me with you tonight, better. So you've got the choice in Christ, great or better. Uh, that's pretty good, right? Great or better? So that's a real experience. I'm OK with God. Sanctification. That's Christ likeness, the Spirit of God within us, the Word of God that is guiding us, is guiding us to be more like Christ. Okay, how does that feel, more like Christ? Well, one word, joy, joy. I mean, how do you feel when you know and you see the right thing to say and do as a Christian, you see it, and then you do it. How does that feel? Oh, that feels wonderful, doesn't it? You're saying, oh Lord, thank you. Thank you for giving me that opportunity to serve you or do this or, you know, I didn't know this morning that I would have this great opportunity or you know, whatever it is. There's joy knowing that I am reflecting Christ, that I have shared my faith. I never knew and then all of a sudden the guy came to work on the garden and we were talking and I shared my faith with him and I, you know, I said, wait a minute, I've got a Bible talk thing I'll give you and I ran back in the house and I got a little mini book and I gave it to him and he said he'd come to church on Sunday. I mean, did you make any money there? No. What's the feeling? Oh, I obeyed, go, to all the world and preach to God. I just obeyed that. I shared that with that person. I'm great and I'm going to be there Sunday hoping that they come to, to services. Yeah, you feel something as you grow in Christ. And then of course, the eternal aspect of it. What's the experience? What's one experience of eternal life? Hmm. Do you experience timelessness? You know, is it like you never grow old? Well, no, of course not. Just a look in the mirror every day tells you that that's not so. But it's my, I begin to get in touch with my spirit in Christ. And I realize that my spirit in Christ never grows old. 
The spirit in me does not grow old. Why? Because I have assurance. I'm, I'm afraid to have pain when I die. Why? Because I'm human. God wired me that way. I, I better be afraid so that I don't take stupid chances with my life that he's given me. Sure, we're, we're all like that. But you know, people say, I, I just don't want to be extinguished and I exist no more. I'm not afraid of that. The older I get, the longer I'm in Christ, the more I am assured that I will be with him. And in, you go from being afraid to die you know, when you're in sin, you go from that to being anxious to die, not to experience the pain of, of death, but anxious to be with the Lord. And to experience that Christ-likeness and that, that righteousness, to experience it fully. Why? Because you have been disconnected from the flesh, which is always in the way of you enjoying your relationship with God. Uh, he summarizes by saying, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. A summary statement. He states the outcome of both experiences. If you follow sin, death. And not just death, you know, the final moment when you, you expire. Death, you know, what, what's the experience of death? Violence, lies, impurity, you know, sinfulness, the results of sins. You know, you know, what's going on? What's going on in the world where uh, the, the president of a country drops bombs on his own people? Not only does he kill them, but that whole mindset, that's the death mindset. You know, even in our political, you know, and I don't want to get into that, but even in our political arena, so much death there, lies and insults and aggression and you know, that's all death. That's all death stuff, the world. So Paul says you, you want that, you want to pursue that, you're just going to get more of that. If you pursue the spirit, well then you'll get more of, of what I've described here. So let's not forget the original thing. Paul's answer to the question, if God responds to my sin with kindness rather than law, why shouldn't I continue enjoying my sin? The answer to that is, those who experience God's kindness are motivated not to sin. In other words, I pursue righteousness much more strenuously under grace than I ever did while I was under the law. When I was under the law, meaning I have to perform perfectly in order to be saved. I wasn't really motivated a whole lot because I, you know, I realized pretty quickly it was impossible. But under grace, oh yes, I have much more motivation. Why? Because under the law, the harder I tried to obey, the more I realized my imperfections. The more I knew the law, the greater awareness I had of my sins the greater knowledge and greater effort to obey the law only widens the gap between myself and God. It's like looking into a mirror. The longer and closer you look at your reflection in the mirror, what happens? The more imperfections you realize. Man, I didn't know I had a zit there. Whoa, look, wow, it's a new wrinkle. You know, the closer you look, the worse it gets. Except for my wife, but that's, she's an exception there. Under grace, however, every effort that I make to please God, every new revelation I understand about Christ, every stage I pass in the process of sanctification, the greater awareness of His presence, His wisdom and His power and His love. I am, the more I pursue righteousness, the greater the reward. The more you pursue law, the more you realize that you fail. You see, in Christ, under grace, greater knowledge, greater service, and greater spiritual maturity actually closes the gap between myself and God. So you pursue the law, the gap gets wider. You pursue under grace, the gap gets smaller. And it produces, as I said before, joy and peace and love within myself. 
So this is why I pursue righteousness. I pursue righteousness, Paul says, because this effort rewards me with the experience of being close to God, a feeling that I have never had before under law, under sin. You know, the Old Testament, remember? The Old Testament, the, 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 uh, the um, sacrificial system, I mean, the, the one lesson that it taught you was you cannot come close to God. You're not good enough. Only the priest can go once a year and then only after a lot of preparation. That's what the law taught. You can't get close to God. But under grace, yeah, you, you, can, you can get closer and closer to God. So pursuing sin brings me farther away from God. Pursuing law demonstrates how far I am from God. So I don't want those things now. I, I want to do something that brings me closer to God. So if I'm under grace and not law, why avoid sin? Answer, because pursuing righteousness is more rewarding than pursuing sin. Very pragmatic, very pragmatic. So the Jews asked the question, if we are under grace, shouldn't we be free to sin? And Paul answers that question two ways. One, no, because you died to sin in baptism. And the second time, no, because pursuing righteousness is much more profitable than pursuing sin. That's how he answered that. Of course, this is not the question that we today ask in the church. We're not Jews. You know, we're not concerned with the law. So in modern Christianity, it doesn't ask that question. Our question is different. Our question is, what is the relationship between grace and good works? That's our question today. What is the relationship between grace and the good works that we do? In other words, if I am under grace, what good are my good deeds? And how many good deeds are enough? I mean, if I'm saved with or without good deeds, why should I even bother? Why should I even try? Now there are a lot of different types of good deeds and there are various impulses or motivations to do good. For example, pragmatism. You do good because this is the best way to succeed. Politicians, social engineers, big business, that's the approach they use. You know, the, number, the second best company for customer service in the United States, Chick-fil-A. Number one, Amazon. Number two, Chick-fil-A for customer service. And you know, why? Well, they don't just say thank you. You know, here's your burger, thank you. They say, here's your chicken. And the, 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 the counter person will say, it was my pleasure. It was my pleasure. I mean, they're just words. Why use one or the other? Because the other works better. People feel more appreciated. If they feel more appreciated and the food is fresher, they'll come back. Pragmatic. Another motivation to do good, pride. People who build monuments to themselves based on their good works. You know, a guy builds a huge hospital and then has his or her name plastered across it. Yeah. You got your reward, everybody, the 100,000 people that drive by on the highway see that hospital building and your name on it, well, okay. There's only one conclusion. You gave the money to build that hospital to do that good work, good for you. And then nobility, another motivation for doing good works. The doing of good because, well, it's the higher or more noble thing to do. It's a, a philosophical conviction, philanthropic conviction. You know, political causes, humanitarian, you know, the Red Cross. The Red Cross is a you know, humanitarian uh, organization. Do good you know, because it's a good thing to help people and so on and so forth. And then another motivation to do good is as an evidence of faith. Now there are two kinds of good works in this category as an evidence of faith. First, Good works done to evidence one's faith in a powerless object. You know, the, like pagan gods. 
You know, in the Old Testament, we read about the Canaanites and others who offered their own children through the fire, right? They would burn them alive to offer them to the god Molech. I mean, talk about giving the most precious thing as an evidence of your faith. You know, we, we put a couple of bucks in the plate. These people took their, you know, their children and burned them in the fire, imagine. What is the degree of their evidence of faith? I'd give them a hundred percent. I'd give them an A with a triple plus as far as devotion. Well, what's the problem here? Well, the problem is they've offered a magnificent sacrifice to something that cannot bless them. The god Molech had, a, had, a, had as much power to give them something as this bench here. So the deed itself can be good. I, I would not say burning your children, but you know, you know, offering stuff. The deed itself is good, but the problem is that the object of worship has no power to reward. Why? Well, there's no such thing as a pagan god. These things don't exist. The only good that comes out of these type of things is the feeling of hope that the worshiper has while that worshiper is alive. Like the other three motivations, however, this reward goes with him to the grave and stops there. And then good works done to evidence faith in a proper object of worship, and that would be Jesus Christ. The difference here is that the object of faith and the object of worship has the power to respond, has the power to bless. He has confirmed my faith with his teaching and his miracles and especially his resurrection. So I don't worship a powerless God. I have historical evidence that this God is real and he's demonstrated his reality to me in so many ways. And he will reward my faith, how? By resurrection, among other ways but finally by resurrecting me from the dead. So, in answer to the question, what good are my good works if I am under grace? Why should I do them? Answer, the answer is that my good works are useful to God as evidence of my faith in Jesus Christ, who has the power to reward my faith, not my works. It's my faith that's being rewarded not my works. That's why uh, the, the poor widow who puts one dollar in the plate gets the same reward as the businessman who puts a hundred dollars in the plate. Why? What's being rewarded here is not the money, what's being rewarded is the faith. So my good works, we know, they cannot justify me. In other words, all the good I do cannot take away my sin. Only the cross of Christ can take away my sins. My good works cannot make me more righteous. I can build 50 hospitals. I can you know, discover the cure for cancer, heart disease, diabetes. You know, I can and give it away to the people. I can do all those you know, good works, but everything I do cannot make me more righteous, meaning more acceptable to God. What does Isaiah say? Your good works are like filthy rags. Only faith in Christ accomplishes this for me, that makes me righteous in God, makes me acceptable in God's sight. Uh, my good works cannot endear me to God. It's one thing to be acceptable to God, but to endear me to God. Only my faith and perseverance in Christ can endear me to God. So, Continuing with our idea. Good works are done as a witness to men that I believe in Jesus. And they are a method to provoke those who see my good works to glorify and praise God. That's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. It isn't because your good works, or it isn't because of your good works that God will praise you. It's because of what you do that others will praise God. I'm not, I'm not wanting God to praise me. I'm wanting other people to praise God. If they see whatever good I do or whatever good life I had, if they say, you know, your God is a wonderful God. 
Your Lord must be a wonderful Lord to motivate you and to encourage you to do such things, to live such a life. Yeah, you've scored a home run right there. Our good works have been prepared in advance by God for us to do. You ever think about that? So that we who do them and others who witness them will glorify and praise God. Ephesians 2.10. Imagine. Imagine that. All the good works. They've been prepared ahead of time for us to do. So let's say there's a hundred good works there that we need to do. Right. God's prepared them. And then we come across one and go, nah, maybe, maybe I won't do that one. Well, then you only got 99 chances now because you, <laughs> you ignored the chance to do a good work that were prepared for you in advance. So the relationship between grace and works is that grace motivates me to do good works in order to witness for Christ and provoke others to glorify God. If not now, then when Jesus returns, when all works will be revealed. So you have to remember that your good works are always seen by God. They're never wasted. So you can tell the difference between good works motivated by grace and those type of works motivated by other method. Works motivated by grace are not a burden. They're eagerly entered into. They're likely carried. Why? Because it's the power of Christ that carries us into them and through them. Works motivated by grace, they glorify God and not man. They're Christ centered. They're biblically supported. They're powered by the Holy Spirit. And then finally, works motivated by grace produce peace of mind, not guilty consciences or dissatisfaction. I'm never dissatisfied when I've obeyed God. Never. Never. And I've never regretted obeying God. Never. Ever. So they produce peace of mind and unity among Christians and joy to those they teach. Works motivated by other factors, well, they produce pride and division and discouragement. At best, they relieve human discomfort and sometimes enlighten for a short time. In the end, if you've truly understood the series that I've been doing on grace and you allow God's grace to touch your hearts, the result will be a greater and freer motivation to do good, not in an effort to be perfect, but rather to do good in order to evidence your faith and to glorify God and to provoke other people to seek out the same experience for themselves. When somebody says to you, you know, I, I want what you have. I, I, you know, I, I'd like to be the way you are. They're saying to you, I see Christ in you. I want that too. That's an opportunity for you to preach the gospel to them. All right. Next week, we actually going to, you know, Paul begins a new thought. The request of grace. This was the response of grace. How do you respond to grace? Now he's going to tackle what does grace want from you? So we're going to take, I'm going to tackle that next week. And that's our lesson for today. Thank you. Appreciate it.